This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anti-Federalist Papers Anti-Federalist No. 17 Letters from the Federal Farmer to the Republican Letter No. 15 January 18, 1788 Dear Sir, before I proceed to examine particularly the powers vested, or which ought to be, vested in each branch of the proposed government, I shall briefly examine the organization of the remaining branch, the judicial, referring the particular examination of its powers to some future letters. In forming this branch, our objects are a fair and open, a wise and impartial interpretation of the laws, a prompt and impartial administration of justice between the public and individuals, and between man and man. I believe there is no feature in a free government more difficult to be well formed than this, especially in an extensive country, where the courts must be numerous or the citizens travel to obtain justice. The Confederation empowers Congress to institute judicial courts in four cases. 1. For settling disputes between individual states. 2. For determining, finally, appeals in all cases of captures. 3 for the trial of piracies and felonies committed on the high seas, and four, for the administration of martial law in the army and navy. The state courts in all other cases possess the judicial powers in all questions arising on the laws of nations, of the states, and of the states individually, nor does Congress appear to have any control over state courts, judges, or officers. The business of the judicial department is, properly speaking, judicial in part, in part executive, done by judges and juries, by certain recording and executive officers, as clerks, sheriffs, and etc. They are all properly limbs or parts of the judicial courts, and have it in charge faithfully to decide upon and execute the laws in judicial cases, between the public and individuals, between man and man. The recording and executive officers in this department may well enough be formed by legislative acts, from time to time, but the offices, the situation, the powers and duties of judges and juries are too important, as they respect the political system, as well as the administration of justice, not to be fixed on general principles by the Constitution. It is true the laws are made by the legislature, but the judges and juries, in their interpretations, and in directing the execution of them, have a very extensive influence for preserving or destroying liberty, and for changing the nature of the government. It is an observation of an improved writer that judicial power is of such a nature, that when we have ascertained and fixed its limits, with all the caution and precision we can, it will be yet formidable, somewhat arbitrary and despotic, that is, after all our cares, we must leave a vast deal to the discretion and interpretation, to the wisdom, integrity, and politics of the judges. These men, such is the state, even of the best laws, may do wrong, perhaps, in a thousand cases, sometimes with and sometimes without design. Yet it may be impracticable to convict them of misconduct. These considerations show how cautious a free people ought to be in forming this, as well as the other branches of their government especially when connected with other considerations equally deserving of notice and attention. When the legislature makes a bad law, or the first executive magistrate usurps upon the rights of the people, they discover the evil much sooner than the abuses of power in the judicial department, the proceedings of which are far more intricate, complex, and out of their immediate view. A bad law immediately excites a general alarm. A bad judicial decision, though not less pernicious in its consequences, is immediately felt, probably by a single individual only, and noticed only by his neighbors, and a few spectators in the court. In this country we have always been jealous of the legislature, and especially the executive, but not always of the judiciary. But very few men attentively consider the essential parts of it, and its proceedings, as they tend to support or to destroy free government. Only a few professional men are in a situation properly to do this, and it is often alleged that instances have not frequently occurred in which they have been found very alert watchmen in the cause of liberty or in the cause of democratic republics. Add to these considerations that particular circumstances exist at this time to increase our inattention to limiting properly the judicial powers 
we may fairly conclude we are we are more in danger of sowing the seeds of arbitrary government in this department than in any other in the unsettled state of things in this country for several years past it has been thought that our popular legislatures have sometimes departed from the line of strict justice while the law courts have shown a disposition more punctually to keep it we are not sufficiently attentive to the circumstances that the measures of popular legislatures naturally settle down in time and gradually approach a mild and just medium while the rigid systems of the law courts naturally become more severe and arbitrary if not carefully tempered and guarded by the constitution and by laws from time to time it is true much has been written and said about some of these courts lately in some of the states but all has been about their fees and but very little to the purposes as to their influence upon the freedom of the government by article three section one the judicial power of the united states shall be vested in one supreme court and in such inferior courts as congress may from time to time ordain and establish the judges of them to hold their offices during good behavior and to receive at stated times a compensation for their services which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office but which i conceive may be increased by the same article two section two the supreme court shall have original jurisdiction in all cases affecting ambassadors and other public ministers and consuls and those in which a state shall be a party and appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact in all other federal causes with such exceptions and under such regulations as the congress shall make by the same section the judicial power shall extend in law and equity to all the federal cases therein enumerated by the same section the jury trial in criminal causes except in cases of impeachment is established but not in civil causes and the whole state may be considered as the vicinage in cases of crimes these clauses present to view the constitutional features of the federal judiciary this has been called a monster by some of the opponents and some even of the able advocates have confessed they do not comprehend it for myself i confess i see some good things in it and some very extraordinary ones there shall be one supreme court there ought in every government to be one court in which all great questions in law shall finally meet and be determined in great britain this is the house of lords aided by all the superior judges in massachusetts it is at present the supreme judicial court consisting of five judges in new york by the constitution it is a court consisting of the president of the senate the senators chancellor and judges of the supreme court and in the united states the federal supreme court or this court in the last resort may by the legislature be made to consist of three five fifth or any other number of judges the inferior federal courts are left by the constitution to be instituted and regulated altogether as the legislature shall judge best and it is well provided that the judges shall hold their offices during good behavior i shall not object to the line drawn between the original and appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court though we should for safety be obliged to form a numerous supreme court and place in it a considerable number of respectable characters it will be found inconvenient for such a court originally to try all the causes affecting ambassadors councils and etc appeals may be carried up to the supreme court under such regulations as congress shall make thus far the legislature does not appear to be limited to improper rules or principles in instituting judicial courts indeed the legislature will have full power to form and arrange judicial courts in the federal cases enumerated at pleasure with these eight exceptions only one there can be but one supreme federal judicial court two this must have jurisdiction as to law and fact in the appellate causes three original jurisdiction when foreign ministers and the states are concerned four the judges of the judicial courts must continue in office during good behavior and five their salaries cannot be diminished while in office six there must be a jury trial in criminal causes seven the trial of crimes must be in the state where committed and eight there must be two witnesses to convict of treason 
In all other respects, Congress may organize the judicial department according to their discretion. The importance of this power, among others, proposed by the legislature, perhaps necessarily, I shall consider hereafter. Though there must, by the Constitution, be but one judicial court, in which all the rays of judicial powers as to law, equity, and fact, in the cases enumerated, must meet, yet this may be made by the legislature a special court, consisting of any number of respectable characters or officers, the federal legislators excepted, to superintend the judicial department, to try the few causes in which foreign ministers and states may be concerned, and to correct errors as to law and fact in certain important causes on appeals. Next, below this judicial head, there may be several courts, such as are usually called superior courts, as a court of chancery, a court of criminal jurisdiction, a court of civil jurisdiction, a court of admiralty jurisdiction, a court of exchequer, and etc., giving an appeal from these, respectively, to the Supreme Judicial Court. These superior courts may be considered as so many points to which appeals may be brought up from the various inferior courts in the several branches of judicial causes. In all these superior and inferior courts, the trial by jury may be established in all cases, and the law and equity properly separated. In this organization, only a few important causes probably would be carried up to the Supreme Court. The superior courts would finally settle almost all causes. This organization, so far as it would respect questions of law, inferior, superior, and a special Supreme Court, would resemble that of New York in a considerable degree, and those of several other states. This, I imagine, we must adopt, or else the Massachusetts plan, that is, a number of inferior courts and one superior or supreme court, consisting of three or five or seven judges, in which one supreme court all the business shall be immediately collected from the inferior ones. The decision of the inferior courts on either plan probably will not much be relied on, and in the latter plan there must be a prodigious accumulation of powers and business in all cases touching law, equity, and facts, and all kinds of causes in a few hands, for whose errors of ignorance or design there will be no possible remedy. As the legislature may adopt either of these, or any other, I shall not dwell longer on this subject. In examining the federal judiciary, there appears to be some things very extraordinary and very peculiar. The judges or their friends may seize every opportunity to raise the judges' salaries, but by the Constitution they cannot be diminished. I am sensible how important it is that judges shall always have adequate and certain support. I am against their depending upon annual or periodical grants because these may be withheld or rendered too small by the dissent or narrowness of any one branch of the legislature. But there is a material distinction between periodical grants and salaries held under permanent and standing laws. The former at stated periods cease, and must be renewed by the consent of all and every part of the legislature. The latter continue, of course, and never will cease or be lowered unless all parts of the legislature agree to do it. A man has a permanent interest in his salary fixed by a standing law, so long as he may remain in office, as in any property he may possess, for the laws regulating the tenure of all property are always liable to be altered by the legislature. The same judge may frequently be in office thirty or forty years. There may often be times, as in cases of war or very high prices, when his salary may reasonably be increased one half or more. In a few years money may become scarce again, and prices fall, and his salary with equal reason and propriety be decreased and lowered. Not to suffer this to be done by consent of all the branches of the legislature is, I believe, quite a novelty in the affairs of government. It is true by a very forced and unnatural construction, the Constitution of Massachusetts, by the governor and minority in the legislature, was made to speak this kind of language. Another circumstance ought to be considered. The mines which have been discovered are gradually exhausted, and the precious metals are continually wasting. Hence the probability is that money, the nominal representative of property, will gradually grow scarcer hereafter, and afford just reasons for gradually lowering salaries. 
the value of money depends altogether upon the quantity of it in circulation, which may also be decreased, as well as increased, from a great variety of causes. The Supreme Court, in cases of appeals, shall have jurisdiction both as to law and fact. That is, in all civil causes carried up to the Supreme Court by appeals, the court or judges shall try the fact and decide the law. Here an essential principle of the civil law is established and the most noble and important principle of the common law exploded. To dwell a few minutes on this material point, the Supreme Court shall have jurisdiction both as to law and fact. What is meant by court? Is the jury included in the term, or is it not? I conceive it is not included, and so the members of convention, I am very sure, understand it. Court, or curia, was a term well understood long before juries existed, the people and the best writers in countries where there are no juries uniformly use the word court, and can only mean by it the judge or judges who determine causes. Also, in countries where there are juries we express ourselves in the same manner. We speak of the court of probate, the court of chancery, justice's court, alderman's court, etc., in which there is no jury. In our supreme courts, common pleas, and etc., in which there are jury trials, we uniformly speak of the court and jury, and consider them as distinct. Were it necessary, I might cite a multitude of cases from law books to confirm beyond controversy this position, that the jury is not included or a part of the court. But the Supreme Court is to have jurisdiction as to law and fact under such regulations as Congress shall make. I confess it is impossible to say how far Congress may, with propriety, extend their regulations in this respect. I conceive, however, they cannot by any reasonable construction go so far as to admit the jury on true common law principles to try the fact, and give a general verdict. I have repeatedly examined this article. I think the meaning of it is that the judges in all final questions as to property and damages shall have complete jurisdiction to consider the whole cause, to examine the facts, and on a general view of them, and on principles of equity as well as law, to give judgment. As the trial by jury is provided for in criminal causes, I shall confine my observations to civil causes, and in these I hold it is the established right of the jury by the common law and the fundamental laws of this country to give a general verdict in all cases when they choose to do it, to decide both as to law and fact, whenever blended together in the issue put to them. Their right to determine as to facts will not be disputed, and their right to give a general verdict has never been disputed, except by a few judges and lawyers governed by despotic principles. Coke, Hale, Holt, Blackstone, DeLome, and almost every other legal or political writer who has written on the subject has uniformly asserted this essential and important right of the jury. Juries in Great Britain and America have universally practiced accordingly. Even Mansfield, with all his wishes about him, dare not directly avow the contrary. What fully confirms this point is that there is no instance to be found where a jury was ever punished for finding a general verdict, when a special one might, with propriety, have been found. The jury trial, especially politically considered, is by far the most important feature in the judicial department in a free country and the right in question is by far the most valuable part, and the last that ought to be yielded of this trial. Juries are constantly and frequently drawn from the body of the people, and free men of the country, and by holding the jury's right to return a general verdict in all cases sacred, we secure to the people at large their just and rightful control in the judicial department. If the conduct of judges shall be severe and arbitrary, and tend to subvert the laws, and change the forms of government, the jury may check them by deciding against their opinions and determinations in similar cases. It is true the freemen of a country are not always minutely skilled in the laws, but they have common sense in its purity, which seldom or never errs in making and applying laws to the condition of the people, or in determining judicial cases when stated to them by the parties. The body of the people principally bear the burdens of the community, they of right ought to have a control in its important concerns, both in making and executing the laws, otherwise they may in a short time be ruined. 
Nor is it merely this control alone we are to attend to. The jury trial brings with it an open and public discussion of all causes, and excludes secret and arbitrary proceedings. This, and the democratic branch in the legislature, as was formerly observed, are the means by which the people are let into the knowledge of public affairs, are enabled to stand as the guardians of each other's rights, and to restrain by regular and legal measures those who otherwise might infringe upon them. I am not unsupported in my opinion of the value of the trial by jury. Not only British and American writers, but de Lome and the most approved foreign writers hold it to be the most valuable part of the British Constitution, and indisputably the best mode of trial ever invented. It was merely by the intrigues of the Popish clergy and of the Norman lawyers that this mode of trial was not used in maritime, ecclesiastical, and military courts, and the civil law proceedings were introduced and, I believe, it is more from custom and prejudice than for any substantial reasons that we do not in all the states establish the jury in our maritime as well as other courts. In the civil law process the trial by jury is unknown. The consequence is that a few judges and dependent officers possess all the power in the judicial department. Instead of the open fair proceedings of the common law, where witnesses are examined in open court and may be cross-examined by the parties concerned, where counsel is allowed, and etc., we see in the civil law process judges alone, who always, long previous to the trial, are known and often corrupted by ministerial influence or by parties. Judges once influenced soon become inclined to yield to temptations and to decree for him who will pay the most for their impartiality. It is, therefore, we find in the Roman and almost all governments where judges alone possess the judicial powers and try all cases that bribery has prevailed. This, as well as the forms of the courts, naturally lead to secret and arbitrary proceedings, to taking evidence secretly, ex part, and to perplexing the cause, and to hasty decisions, but as to jurors it is quite impracticable to bribe or influence them by any corrupt means, not only because they are untaught in such affairs, and possess the honest characters of the common freemen of a country, but because it is not, generally, known till the hour the cause comes on for trial what persons are to form the jury. But it is said that no words could be found by which the states could agree to establish the jury trial in civil causes. I can hardly believe men to be serious who make observations to this effect. The states have all derived judicial proceedings principally from one source, the British system, from the same common source the American lawyers have almost universally drawn their legal information. All the states have agreed to establish the trial by jury in civil as well as in criminal causes. The several states in Congress found no difficulty in establishing it in the Western Territory in the ordinance passed in July 1787. We find that the several states in Congress, in establishing government in that territory, agreed that the inhabitants of it should always be entitled to the benefit of the trial by jury. Thus, in a few words, the jury trial is established in its full extent, and the Convention with as much ease have established the jury trial in criminal cases. In making a constitution we are substantially to fix principles. If in one state damages on default are assessed by a jury, and in another by the judges, if in one state jurors are drawn out of a box, and in another not, if there be other trifling variations, they can be of no importance in the great question. Further, when we examine particular practices of the states, in little matters in judicial proceedings, I believe we shall find they differ near as much in criminal processes as in civil ones. Another thing worthy of notice in this place, the Convention have used the word equity and agreed to establish a chancery jurisdiction, about the meaning and extent of which, we all know, the several states disagree much more than about jury trials. In adopting the latter, they have very generally pursued the British plan, but as to the former we see the states have varied, as their fears and opinions dictated. By the common law in Great Britain and America, there is no appeal from the verdict of the jury. As to facts, to any judges whatever, the jurisdiction of the jury is complete and final in this, and only errors in law are carried up to the House of Lords, the special supreme court in Great Britain, or to the special supreme courts in Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, and etc. 
Thus the juries are left masters as to facts, but by the proposed constitution directly the opposite principle is established. An appeal will lay in all appellate causes from the verdict of the jury, even as to mere facts, to the judges of the Supreme Court. Thus, in effect, we establish a civil law in this point, for if the jurisdiction of the jury be not final as to facts, it is of little or no importance. By Article three, Section 2, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution the laws of the United States. What is here meant by equity? What is equity in a case arising under the Constitution? Possibly the clause might have the same meaning were the words in law and equity omitted. Cases in law must differ widely from cases in law and equity. At first view, by thus joining the word equity with the word law, if we mean anything, we seem to mean to give the judge a discretionary power. The word equity in Great Britain has in time acquired a precise meaning. Chancery proceedings there are now reduced to a system, but this is not the case in the United States. In New England, the judicial courts have no powers in cases in equity except those dealt out to them by the legislature in certain limited portions by legislative acts. In New York, Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina, powers to decide in cases of equity are vested in judges distinct from those who decide in matters of law. And the states generally seem to have carefully avoided giving unlimitedly to the same judges powers to decide in cases in law and equity. Perhaps the clause would have the same meaning were the words this constitution omitted there is in it either a careless complex misuse of words, in themselves of extensive significance, or there is some meaning not easily to be comprehended. Suppose a case arising under the Constitution, suppose the question judicially moved, whether by the Constitution Congress can suppress a state laid tax on poles, lands, or as an excise duty, which may be supposed to interfere with a federal tax. By the letter of the Constitution, Congress will appear to have no power to do it, but the judges may decide the question on principles of equity as well as law. Now, omitting the words in law and equity, they may decide according to the spirit and true meaning of the Constitution, as collected from what must appear to have been the intentions of the people when they made it. Therefore, it would seem that if these words mean anything, they must have a further meaning yet I will not suppose it intended to lodge an arbitrary power or discretion in the judges, to decide as their conscience, their opinions, their caprice, or their politics might dictate. Without dwelling on this obscure clause, I will leave it to the examination of others. Yours, The Federal Farmer. End of Anti-Federalist, Number 17.